This is a real human brain, and these are multiple nerves that would innervate or control the muscles of the upper limb. Now, why would I be showing you a brain and nerves during a video about hydration, water, and electrolytes? Well, water and electrolytes are actually quite relevant to how your brain, nerves, and even muscles work. But how much water and electrolytes do we really need on a daily basis? And what is the best strategy for replenishing water and electrolytes? We are definitely going to answer these questions, but let me first go back to the brain and nerves so that we can start with one of the important reasons as to why you actually even need water and electrolytes. Your brain is made up of about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons, and your nerves are primarily just bundles of neurons wrapped in connective tissue. And what is remarkable is that these neurons send electrical signals. But how in the world does your body generate an electrical signal? It's not like we plug ourselves into an outlet and charge ourselves up. That would obviously be bad, but the story of our ability to generate electrical signals and how this relates to hydration starts with some quick info about the periodic table. Now many of you have probably seen the periodic table, which shows you the elements. Now some of these are extremely important to the functioning of the human body. There's some obvious ones like oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, but also things like sodium, potassium, chlorine, magnesium, and calcium to name a few. Now, for those of you that are terrified or just hate chemistry, hang with me for just a second here because this is really cool how this relates to water, electrolytes, and your overall hydration. All of these elements listed on the periodic table are listed in their purest form in their neutral state. So for example, if you had an atom of sodium in a neutral state, it would have the same number of protons, which have a positive charge, and then the same number of electrons, which have a negative charge. The negatives and positives would cancel each other out, and again, you'd have a neutral atom of sodium. But in nature, many of these atoms don't exist in a neutral state. They exist with a charge. And an atom with a charge is referred to as an ion. And this is extremely important for our story on hydration and electrolytes. Things like sodium and potassium, for example, lose an electron because they're more stable this way, and therefore mostly exist in nature as a positive ion. Magnesium and calcium are also positive ions, where something like chlorine gains an electron in, and is a negative ion. And you may already know this, but sodium and chloride love to get together with their positive and negative charges to form sodium chloride, which we all know is table salt. But again, what does all this have to do with water and electrolytes? Well, when ions like sodium and potassium are tossed or placed in water, we call these ions electrolytes. And this is because an ion in water has the ability to conduct an electrical current in water. And luckily, we are made up of a lot of water. But this gives us the answer to how our neurons can generate electrical signals. Our neurons take electrolytes and pump some of them to the outside of the cell membrane of the neuron while pumping other electrolytes to the inside of the neuron. And this creates a charge difference from the outside of the neuron compared to the inside, and therefore gives the neuron an ability to send the electrical signal. And this signal is known as an action potential. So you can see how important water and electrolytes are just for the proper functioning of your nervous system, and even for muscle contractions, because muscles will use electrolytes in a very similar way to create action potentials for muscle contractions. And this process works beautifully when we have the proper balance of water and electrolytes. But what happens when we are not in balance with our water and electrolytes? Well, for us to best understand that point, We'll want to cover some of the other functions of water and electrolytes and some of the things that cause us to lose these substances. And then of course that will lead us into some of the best strategies for replenishing our water and electrolytes. But real quick I want to take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, AG1. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that I've been drinking every day for years now. It's made with 75 high quality whole food sourced ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. This is a formulation based on the latest science that maintains the highest quality of standards. And speaking of standards, AG1 is also NSF certified for sport, which means it's tested to ensure that what's on the label is actually in the bottle. One of my other favorite benefits of AG1 is that it can help sustain energy levels throughout the day. And since I'm quite selective about my caffeine intake throughout the week, this has definitely been a bonus for me. It's also ridiculously easy to make. All you do is take one scoop, Add eight ounces of water, shake it up, drink it down, and carry on with your day. And I really do believe that the more you can streamline and simplify your health routine, the more likely you are to adhere to it. And getting so many high quality ingredients in just one easy scoop certainly helps one to streamline their routine. 
So if you're interested, go to drinkag1.com slash humananatomy, and they'll give our audience a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3 plus K2, as well as five free travel packets with your first purchase. That information and the link will also be in the description below. So let's quickly talk about some other important reasons why we need water and electrolytes, and then we can talk about what happens when we get out of water balance, and then of course rehydration strategies. Water is the universal solvent, meaning substances dissolve in water, and water provides a medium in which many of the body's chemical reactions take place, and is therefore critical for these physiological processes. Water also acts as a transport medium, as it's a major component of the blood, and is also essential for thermal regulation, maintaining that proper temperature throughout the body. And this will be especially important when we talk about cooling off the body through sweat in just a minute. Water also helps to provide moisture for certain tissues and structures, and even provides protection or a form of cushioning as cerebral spinal fluid for the brain and as fluid found in cartilage and joints. Electrolytes not only allow our neurons to function properly, but they also affect how and where water is distributed throughout the body. As water tends to flow towards areas or spaces in the body where there are greater amounts of solutes or electrolytes. And there are pretty much three main places where you find water throughout the body. You find it in the intravascular space, which is to say inside the blood vessels as plasma. And this accounts for about 7% of the total body water. You also find it in the intracellular space, which would be inside the cells. And this accounts for the largest amount of body water at about 66%. And you also find it in the interstitial space, which is the area between the blood vessels and the cells, which accounts for about 26% of total body water. And how water is distributed throughout the body is really helpful to help you understand certain scenarios, like with water distribution issues or with water and electrolyte imbalances. Like if you were to have too much fluid in the interstitial space, that space between the blood vessels and the cells, this could result in swelling or edema. Or if you had too much fluid in the intravascular space, like the space in the blood vessels, this could create increases in your blood pressure and why sometimes you hear about this relationship between high blood pressure and high salt diets. And what about the opposite end of this? If you had too little fluid in that intravascular space, which can happen with extreme fluid loss through like extreme sweating through exercise, this would result in hypovolemia, making it more difficult for your cardiovascular system to deliver blood to the tissues throughout the body. And if it gets bad enough, could lead to hypovolemic shock. And let's even go with another extreme case. If you drink way too much water, which we'll talk about a case where this occurred with a marathon runner, this could cause too much fluid to enter the cells, that intracellular space, and cause the cells, like the neurons, to swell and therefore would not function properly, and in extreme cases, could even result in death. So what is our goal with water and electrolyte intake? Well, I don't think it's gonna be too surprising that we wanna spend most of our time in a state of euhydration, or slightly above it. And I'll explain that slightly above part in just a minute. But euhydration would be a normal or adequate amount of water for normal physiological processes to occur. This would allow us to be in water and electrolyte balance. So we've got the proper amounts of water and electrolytes in the places they need to be in, in the interstitial, intravascular, and intracellular spaces. Hyperhydration, as the name implies, would be having an excess of water beyond the normal state of hydration. Whereas hypohydration is an insufficient amount of water below the normal state of hydration. And just as an FYI, most of us don't really use the term hypohydration. The term dehydration is more often used, but they technically are a little different. I know it's splitting hairs a little bit, but dehydration is actually the process of moving from a state of euhydration to a state of dehydration. Either way, I think we can agree that we'd want to avoid large amounts of dehydration that could put us into a hypohydrated state. And if we wanna develop a protocol for maintaining euhydration and get some actual numbers on how much water and electrolytes we should ingest, it would be helpful for us to understand the different ways that we can lose water and electrolytes and add some of those numbers up. There are two categories of water loss. There's what is known as sensible water loss and insensible water loss. And keep in mind, electrolytes will be lost by some of these mechanisms as well. Insensible loss is how it sounds. You don't really sense it or you're not really aware of this type of water loss. This mainly comes in two forms. One is through breathing. We use water to warm and moisten the air. And again, you aren't really aware of this unless you breathe on some glass or you're breathing in a cold environment. Another is water loss through the skin that is not sweat. 
Water that is essentially used to moisten the skin and keep it from cracking. Total insensible water loss is about one liter per day. Although this can increase a little bit in environments that are more dry and cold, and even through increased breathing rates that occur during exercise. Sensible water loss is water loss that you would notice. This is primarily through sweat, urine, and the feces. Now, unless you're having some major bowel issues such as diarrhea, water loss through the feces is fairly minimal at about 100 milliliters per day. The urine is going to be more variable than the feces depending on how much water and salt you ingest, and this can also be influenced by certain drugs or medications. But the average person under homeostatic conditions will urinate about 1.5 liters per day. And sweat will also have quite a bit of variability depending on your environment. You'll lose more water and electrolytes if you are in a hot and humid environment, and obviously exercise and physical activity can greatly influence this. But someone that does not exercise and is not in a hot and humid environment, sweating can be very minimal and may only lose up to like 100 milliliters per day. But on the other hand, someone exercising or doing hard manual labor in a hot and humid environment could lose over two liters per hour. And finally, how much water and electrolytes do we need to ingest in order to maintain a state of eu-hydration? Well, we do know that this is a bit of a moving target because the amount of water in the body is constantly changing with fluid constantly being removed and added. So the first general strategy that we could apply to nearly everyone's situation is to drink an excess of water to a state of slight or mild hyperhydration. Then the body can retain what is needed to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, and then the kidneys can excrete the excess. Now keep in mind, I said slight or mild hyperhydration. This can definitely be taken too far. But for someone that isn't in a hot and humid environment, doesn't exercise or sweat a lot, maintaining hydration through this strategy alone would be quite easy. If we added the numbers we mentioned previously for a person in this situation, it was about one liter of insensible loss per day, about 1.5 liters loss to the urine, about 100 milliliters loss to sweat, and another 100 milliliters loss in the feces. That puts us at about 2.7 liters. We'll call it three liters for a little bit of hyperhydration into account for just in case someone sees the person they have a crush on and they get all nervous and sweaty. But again, replenishing three liters isn't very difficult. For those of you who've, had, who've been told cups of water your whole life, like me, three liters is just over 12 and a half cups. And the average American actually gets about 20 to 25% of their water from the water contained in the food they ingest, which just adds to the relative ease of replenishing water in this situation. But we wanna know about how much we need when it comes to exercise and physical activity. And that obviously can change the numbers quite a bit. Now again, there are many variables that influence how much water you'll lose through exercise. Are you exercise in a 70 degree environment or a 100 degree environment? What's the humidity? Are you exercising for 20 minutes or three hours? These variables make it very difficult to give a one size fits all approach. But I can give you some important guidelines and strategies to start with that are based on data. And I've also found some of these quite useful for myself. Plus, give you some practical ideas or ways to measure your own status of hydration while you're at home. But here's a number that is relatively consistent. During exercise, most people can only absorb about one liter of water per hour. So in the more extreme exercise conditions, where somebody could lose over two liters of water through the sweat per hour, even if you're drinking during exercise, you wouldn't be able to keep up with that amount of fluid loss. So that means we need to employ strategies prior to exercise and definitely after exercise to replenish what we've lost. Prior to exercise, a good rule of thumb to start with is to consume approximately five to 10 milliliters of fluid per kilogram of body weight. So if you only know your body weight in pounds, you can convert that to kilograms by dividing by 2.2. So let's use me as an example. I weigh 185 pounds, dividing that by 2.2 gives us about 84 kilograms. So if we went on the lower end of that recommendation, we would multiply 84 kilograms by five and that would give us 420 milliliters to consume. If we went with the upper end, we would multiply by 10, and that would give us 840 milliliters to consume prior to exercise for my body weight. Now, you would want to start this about two to four hours prior to exercise, but something that is important with these numbers is that this assumes that you are already in a state of eu-hydration. If you are in a state of hypohydration, you may need to add an additional three to five milliliters of fluid per kilogram of body weight on top of the five to 10 milliliters that we just discussed. 
And again, we'll get to some strategies on how to tell if you're in a hypohydrated state in just a second. During exercise, a fairly safe number to go with is about one liter of fluid per hour, taken periodically throughout the hour rather than all at once. Now, some may be able to tolerate and absorb a little bit more, and they may try to add a little more, especially during long endurance type events, but this number is relatively safe for two reasons. One, it gets us close to the maximum amount of fluid that most people can absorb. And it's not too much, even during lighter exercise sessions, that could cause you to get into a dangerous state of hyperhydration. And this is assuming you have healthy and functioning kidneys and that you didn't drink excessive amounts of fluid prior to exercise. But I do want to clarify an important point. I am not suggesting that you try to drink one liter of water per hour during all exercise sessions. There are definitely intense sessions when you are sweating profusely in a hot and humid environment when this number would be appropriate. But during a session that you are exercising, say, in an air-conditioned environment and not sweating as much, starting with a lower amount and making small incremental adjustments based on something like pre- and post-exercise weight differences would be a good protocol to start with. And this leads us to some post-exercise hydration protocols that will help us to make adjustments if you were to undershoot the amount you needed to drink during exercise or just couldn't keep up with the water loss due to intense conditions. After exercise, it is recommended that you drink approximately 1.25 to 1.5 liters of fluid per kilogram of body weight loss, starting as soon as you can after exercise. Or in other words, if you measure yourself in pounds, a 2.2 pound loss of body weight would require about 1.5 liter of fluid intake. Now you may have noticed that I haven't said much about electrolyte replacement yet. And when it comes to electrolyte replacement for exercise, sodium tends to be the biggest player. And this may or may not surprise you, but if someone consumes the typical amount of dietary sodium, the data actually shows that there's little need for sodium replacement during exercise if the exercise is less than 90 to 120 minutes. In that case, most people can just replenish it through food and fluids afterwards. But anything greater than 90 minutes to two hours, especially if someone is a big sweater and or in a hot and humid environment, it can be beneficial to ingest sodium at about 0.7 to one gram per hour. And that can be mixed in with the fluid that the person is also drinking. So if you know you are going to be exercise or competing for multiple hours, you would wanna start this during the first hour. It's not like you'd wanna wait until after the second hour to start ingesting the sodium. Now I do want to again acknowledge that there is variability in this from person to person, and that the one size fits all approach is very difficult even with the electrolyte situation. Like some of those that are on the more extreme end of training, heavy sweaters, training more than once in a day, it may make sense for them to ingest electrolyte containing beverages even during shorter exercise sessions. But again, for most people, the above recommendations of fluid and electrolyte intake would be a great starting point. The last thing I wanted to cover is giving you a reasonable strategy to monitor your hydration status. I say reasonable because you could perform expensive lab tests like blood draws that measure plasma osmolarity, you could collect your own urine throughout the day, but probably don't want to measure the volume of your own urine every time you pee. However, urine test strips that measure the specific gravity of your urine are fairly inexpensive these days, but you still have to collect your own urine and dip the strip in it, and I would be lying if I told you that I hadn't done this on myself on more than one occasion, but some of the more feasible strategies are using a urine color chart, for example. There are some drawbacks to this. You would want to make sure that you're comparing it to a white background under good lighting, and certain foods and medications do have the potential to change the color of the urine. And the other method that we have already touched on a little bit is weighing yourself before and after a workout because any weight loss during a workout can mostly be attributed to fluid loss. Now this can be somewhat challenging to monitor over the long term if someone is also trying to lose weight at the same time. But again, if you weigh yourself just prior to and just after a workout, you can get some pretty decent results. But to help you get a little bit more accuracy, you can combine some of these methods. And how you would do this is in the morning, you would assess three things, your thirst, urine color, and weight. If one of these conditions is present, then you might be hypohydrated. If two conditions are present, then it is likely that you are hypohydrated. And if all three conditions are present, then it is very likely that you are hypohydrated. So hopefully that gave you some useful tools to assess your own hydration status, as well as some good baseline numbers that you can utilize to replenish your own water and electrolytes. And thanks for watching the video, everyone. Please comment below, let us know what you thought of the video. 
Like and subscribe if you want to support the channel. We've got AG1 listed down in the description below if you're interested in checking them out. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.